Magandang araw po sa lahat and uh, thank you all for attending our panel. My paper is entitled More Than a Charitable Work, Dominican Missionaries, Unwanted Children in China and the Spanish Colonial State in the Mid-19th Century Philippines. This paper is about the un an unsuccessful yet interesting project, a brainchild of the Dominican missionaries of purchasing and transporting unwanted children from China to the Philippines in the mid 19th century. It aims to examine why and how this project was conceived by the Dominicans to identify the actors, institutions, and processes that should have been involved in its execution, to determine the factors that prevented its implementation, and to discuss some events that occurred as a consequence of the failed project. The main source of information I used for this paper was a series of correspondences among various groups and officials such as the Spanish ambassador to China, the Dominican procurador of the Spanish apostolic missions in China, Cochin China and Tongking, the governor general of the Philippines, and the subsecretary of Queen Isabella II. The Dominican missionaries played a leading role in this project. They meticulously and systematically laid out its plan down to the smallest details. As religious fathers, they initially framed it as an important work of charity among the Chinese, that Catholics in the Philippines and Spain who would support this endeavor were not only performing their Christian obligations, but more importantly, they would become a means for the salvation of numerous heathens in this vast empire. However, because the project required an enormous amount of funds, the Dominicans subsequently modified the framing of the project. Instead of only highlighting its religious dimension, they now also emphasize its economic advantages for the colonial coffers. For the Dominicans, the project was more than a charitable work. It was a pragmatic solution to address the labor and financial concerns in the Philippines during that time. This is story of the Dominicans' child immigration project did not actually begin in China. It began in Sulu. In February 1848, Spain launched a successful military campaign in Balangin, an island in the Sulu archipelago, which served as an important base for the piratical quote unquote activities of the Samal Balanginis. Since the 18th century, the Samal Balanginis ha had captured countless individuals from Luzon and Visayas and sold them in slave markets. After defeating these Moro pirates, quote unquote, Spanish troops led by Governor General Ciso Claveria rounded up some 350 Balangini women and children and brought them to Manila. From Manila, these prisoners, particularly the children, were transported to Cagayan, Isabela, and Nueva Vizcaya and were adopted by Catholic families there. These families were tasked to care for and help these Muslim children convert into the Catholic faith. The Dominicans were the ones who proposed and spearheaded this transportation and conversion scheme among the Samal Balangini children in the Cagayan Valley. They emphasized to Governor General Claveria that through this project, two interrelated uh, colonial goals were accomplished, religious and economic. For the Dominicans, the conversion of the Moro children's, uh, children from Sulu was an important achievement for the Holy Catholic Church. On the other hand, when these children reach adulthood, they would augment the insufficient labor supply needed for the government's tobacco monopoly. Since the 1830s, when the Philippines began exporting tobacco, the Spanish colonial government had been looking for additional laborers to, to plant tobacco. In fact, in 1842, Governor General Marcelino de Oraa issued a decree stating that young and physically able Chinese who were unable to pay their taxes had to be banished to Cagayan to farm this important cash crop. The Dominicans wanted to replicate the successful scheme among the Samal Balangini children, but this time their focus was on unwanted children in China. In the middle of 1848, Dominican missionaries in China, led by Father Juan Ferrando, began collecting information for the child immigration project. From their long history of missionary activities in China that started in 1587, the Dominicans were aware of two important facts that were crucial to their project. First, many areas in China experienced periodic natural calamities and social disturbances that greatly affected the lives of millions of Chinese. And second, 
Chinese families preferred male offspring over female ones. In times of severe famines, some despondent Chinese parents would exchange their unwanted children for rice or abandon them to die on the streets. There were also those who sold them or leave them in orphanages, which were commonly administered by foreign missionaries. For the Dominicans, this project was aimed primarily at, quote unquote, saving these children from, quote, from, from the inhumanity and misery of the poor Gentiles in this vast empire, unquote. The Dominicans had to obtain all necessary information to come up with a well-organized plan for their project. They acquired such knowledge from other Dominican missionaries, as well as fellow European missionaries from other orders and congregations. Some Christian Chinese converts and Spanish captains of passenger and cargo ships. From these individuals and groups, the Dominicans learned about the main areas in China that would serve as the main sources of these children. These places included Fujian, Macau, Hong Kong, Ningpo in uh, Zhejiang, and even Shanghai. The best procurement centers, however, were Fuchou and Emui, the two uh, Vicariatos Apostolicos of the Dominicans in Fujian during the 19th century. Fuchou was uh, Fujian's capital and the seat of the political, economic, and social cultural administration in this southern uh, province. The Dominicans had enough missionaries in Fuchou to buy the children, as Fuchou was divided into three Vicarias Provinciales, comprising the missions of Fuchou, Fogan, and Yanping each with the number of Dominican missionaries. Based on the information they gathered, the Dominicans knew that the price of each child was dependent on where this child was to be purchased, as well as the child's gender and age. In Fujian, a three-year-old girl could be bought for 15 to 18 pesos. In some areas, children between five and 10 years old, regardless of gender, could be purchased for not more than 16 pesos each. The Procurador of the Lazarist missionaries also informed them that it was even possible to buy children ages 4 to 7 years old for only 12 to 15 pesos per child. Moreover, the Dominicans also received a report in 1840 that the hospital in Ningpo had around 400 foundlings. Most of these foundlings were given by their parents to the hospital for free. Only female children aged 11 and above were sold at an agreed price between the buyer and the hospital staff, as these girls could already do household chores. Due to the availability of numerous unwanted children, the Dominican set their goal of transporting some 2,500 2, children. The majority, if not all, would be females for the first batch of their project. In accordance with their plan, after acquiring the children, the Dominican missionaries would house and feed them for a few months while all necessary arrangements for the children's transportation were being undertaken. This included tra securing travel documents, coordinating with Spanish uh, ship captains in Hong Kong and Macau, and coordinating with the Dominicans in Manila, who were to send out these children to Catholic uh, uh, families. When the Dominican missionaries presented their project to the Spanish ambassador to China, Sinibaldo de Mas, and Governor General Narciso Claveria, it was evident that the religious fathers left no stone unturned. For these two Spanish officials, however, a fundamental aspect that needed to discuss further was the financial side of the project. Since the Chinese children would have to be purchased, how much was needed on a yearly basis? Where should the funds come from? And what benefits would the founder or funders gain from the project? In their proposal, the Dominican missionaries stated that the project needed around eight to 10,000 pesos fuertes annually to obtain Chinese children and transport them to Manila. They admitted that they had some funds from their obras pias, but soon after the abolition of the Galen trade, this source of income had significantly diminished. Hence, they needed other institutions to implement the project. They identified two possible sources of funds. The first was the charitable institution called Santa Infancia, which when they forwarded their proposal to the Spanish officials was yet to be established. The Dominicans intended to create such institutions in Spain and in the Philippines. They got the idea from the French missionaries. In 1843, the French missionary and bishop, Father Charles de Fordin Hanson, 
established in Paris the Association de la Santa Infancia. This philanthropic institution was composed of young Catholic French boys and girls below the age of 21. Each member paid five centimos as his or her monthly due. The collected amount was used to support French missionary activities in China and other idolatrous countries. The Catholic Church in France was enjoined to create branches of Santa Infancia in different areas of the country in order to acquire more funds. In China, French missionaries used these funds to house and feed Chinese orphans. At least 400,000 pesos fuertes were annually sent from France to support, support this charitable program. The initial purpose of the institution was only to provide food and shelter to Chinese children. Its long-term goal, however, was to convert these children to Christianity so that in the future they would play a vital role in proselytizing among their non-Christian compatriots. Although the Santa Infancia once established in Spain and in the Philippines would be an important source of funds for the Dominican project, it would take some, some time for this institution to be set up and become operational. The main source, therefore, would be funds from the Spanish colonial government in Manila. It was for this reason that Dominicans repackaged the project and underscored how the colonial government would benefit from it. They claimed that more than a, a charitable act, the project was a practical remedy to address the labor concerns in the Philippines. The abolition of the gallon trade, the opening of the Philippines to international trade, and the subsequent development of a commodity-based export-oriented economy required an increased number of laborers. These workers were needed to develop the colony's vast arable lands and open its frontiers to generate the volume of agricultural commodities that the world market demanded. From the standpoint of the Spanish colonial authorities, the Indios Naturales or the Filipinos were inherently indolent and were not a, rel a reliable source of labor. So it was not surprising that the economy during the first half of the century was in the hands of the Mestizos de Sanglei or Chinese Mestizos. In the early 1800s, the Spanish colonial government encouraged two groups of foreigners to migrate to the Philippines and work on the colony's agricultural lands, the Japanese and the Chinese. While the Spanish authorities preferred Japanese agriculturists over the Chinese due to the former's exceptional work ethic, it was rather difficult to attract them to come to the islands. Uh, the long-standing commercial relations and migration networks of the Chinese in the Philippines, on the other hand, made it easier for them to migrate to and work in the colony. Framed within this context, the Dominican project therefore had a huge potential, albeit not to be realized immediately, to augment the number of native laborers in the Philippines. According to Dominicans, a uh, Spanish colonial government would have the return of investment once the children reach maturity. Female children, uh, female Chinese children upon reaching mature age would be utilized as house helpers and nannies. They could also be married off to non-Christian men in the Philippines. They would then become instrumental in converting their husbands into Catholicism. Male Chinese children upon reaching adulthood could become missionaries in the Philippines or in China. Their primary purpose, however, was to become laborers in the cultivation and manufacture of tobacco and wine in Luzon and Visayas. These men and women who were once unwanted children in China would also contribute to the colonial coffers as they had to pay their taxes, which could reach up to 20,000 pesos fuertes every year based on the calculation of the Dominicans. Governor General Claveria welcomed the Dominican project and viewed it with much interest and enthusiasm. The colonial treasury in Manila, however, had no funds for the project because the government had been spending heavily on its military campaigns in southern Philippines. After defeating and occupying Balangini in 1848 and Davao in 1849, Spain aspired to subjugate the entire island of Mindanao. Such military operations needed a huge amount of resources. There were significant fiscal reforms initiated in the 1840s and 1850s aimed at generating additional funds for these costly campaigns, but these initiatives did not produce what the government had expected. Apart from spending for the preparation of the actual battles, the government also allotted funds for the pensions and compensations of Spanish soldiers who were physically incapacitated because of the involvement in the campaigns. 
Governor General Claveria was willing that the government was incapable of financing the Dominican project. Apart from the letter of Subsecretary Antonio Caballero in behalf of Queen Isabella II to Governor General Calveria, dated 27 May 1850, no other missive related to the Dominican project is available that could convey what exactly happened to the said project. It is safe to assume, however, that the project, due to the lack of funds, did not push through. In 1855, half a decade after Caballero's letter to Governor General Claveria, Intramuros had 525 Chinamen and only seven females, two women and five children. In the same year, it was reported that Binondo, the economic center of the Philippines and the main place of concentration of the Chinese population the colony, there were 5,055 Chinamen, but only eight females. Of this number of females, three were seven years old and below, four were between eight and 14 years old, and one was between 14 and 25 years old. In terms of occupation and civil status, one was an unmarried helper, soltera criada, six were unmarried children, soltera niñas, and one was an unemployed married woman. While the Dominican project did not materialize, some sources suggest that their idea of transporting children, especially female ones, was taken up, albeit illegally by unscrupulous individuals. Historian Monica Hines Blas argues that from 1850 to 1898, clandestine human trafficking occurred in the Philippines. It was evident, according to her, from Boring's claim in 1855, that kidnapping of Chinese ch female children to be sent to the Philippines had become rampant. It is also possible that the same scheme was utilized by some Spanish and Chinese mysterious businessmen in the Philippines at that time. For example, in 1850, Spanish merchant Juan Bautista Marcaida and the Matia Mer Merchacatore y Compañía brought 182 Chinese to Batanes. These Chinese were intended to work as laborers in these frontier islands in northern Luzon. This number included 28 Chinese from Manila, 53 from Hainan Islands, and 101 from Amoy. Of this number, five were women, and three were children. Finally, historian Benito Legarda Jr. documented a case of a young six-year-old girl who was purchased in Emory in 1850, 1851. Captain Juan Lopez of the Spanish ship Narciso uh, bought, brought this girl to Manila and sold her to George and Josefina Sturgis of the American company Russell and Sturgis. It has to be added here that in 1849, the Dominican missionaries had already mentioned that there were uh, some ship captains who had the practice of purchasing children in China and then selling them in the Philippines for as much as 40 to 50 pesos each. The Sturgis has bought the Chinese girl to take care of their son, Joey, who, however, died early. Josefina Sturgis liberated the girl and helped in the girl's conversion. The girl was baptized and named Juana. After she was widowed, Josefina brought Juana to Boston. Despite these negative consequences, the Dominican's unsuccessful project nonetheless led to more encouraging events. One of the, most, uh, one of the two most important ones was the establishment of the uh, La Ob uh, Obra de la Santa Infancia in Spain in 1852. From the capital Madrid, the Santa Infancia, organized by the religious, spread to different parts of the country. It was in, as was envisioned by the Dominicans in 1848, the Santa Infancia collected funds to support the missionary activities of the Spanish missionaries in China and elsewhere in the region. By 1870, a Santa Infancia was also established in Fucho, the capital of Fujian. But unlike the Santa Infancia in Spain, this one in China was a charitable institution that housed 300 female Chinese children who were under the care of and supervision of uh, the Dominican sisters. Another important consequence of the failed uh, Dominican project was the issuance of Governor General Claveria of a decree in December 1849, while the Dominicans were still lobbying for the child immigration project. The Claveria decree allowed Chinese immigration to and residents in the Philippines. It was a means to liberalize the, the restrictive Chinese immigration decree issued after the last expulsion, Chinese expulsion in 1766. 
Although the decree allowed the Chinese to come to the islands, however, strict regulations on registration and, the, and on the issuance of passports and other travel documents among them had to be properly observed. The Dominican Missionaries uh, project of purchasing unwanted children in China and shipping them out to the Philippines during the mid 19th century is an interesting subject of research. Although unsuccessful, this project highlights the role of the religious, in this case the Dominicans, in attempting to help find ways and means to address the lack of dependable laborers in the colony at that time. It also shows how the Dominicans' knowledge of Chinese culture and history and their transnational networks in China, the Philippines, and Spain were crucial in determining the best way that the project could be implemented. An examination on how the project was conceptualized and reformulated also demonstrates the interdependence between the Dominicans and the Spanish colonial state in maintaining, protecting, and advancing the respective agenda in the Philippines. It is evident from the discussion above that although the project had economic potentials, the Dominicans proposed it at an inopportune time. Spain was waging military campaigns to take hold of the southern part of the Philippines, which for a very long time was beyond the direct control of the Spanish authorities. As Governor Joel Claveria pointed out, the project could not be prioritized by the government. But despite their failure to launch this meticulously planned immigration project, the Dominicans were able to lobby for the establishment of the Santa Infancia and the issuance of Governor Claveria's 1849 Chinese immigration decree. It can be argued, therefore, that more than a charitable work, their child immigration project, to a certain extent, became an important vehicle for the Dominicans to acquire more funds for their missionary activities in China and elsewhere in Asia, and to encourage Chinese immigration, especially immigration of uh, Chinese laborers to the Philippines from 1850 to the end of the Spanish regime in 1890. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much.